Ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of the Candid Savage. If you've never listened to me before, my name is Ashley Mitz here, and this podcast is everything health, fitness, lifestyle, and well, pretty much everything in between that I feel like talking about. Today's episode is a big one, especially for Canadians, because as much of, if you don't know what's going on, you're living under a fucking rock. Legalization of marijuana. We'll just cut to the chase. A lot of people don't understand marijuana. They don't understand that there's also another name called cannabis for it. It's also very new for a lot of people, and there's also stigmas that are attached with this plant. I am all for it, mainly because I've seen cannabis help a lot of people with health conditions. So I was against it a long time ago, and I am no longer against it. Now, that being said, with the new legalization, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of concerns, which there should be, you know. But the problem is no one's answering the questions properly, and no one's really educated to answer them, and we're all still learning as we go. So I thought, why not bring in a cannabis lawyer? Someone who probably understands this shit a lot better than, well, our prime minister, let's be honest here. So welcome to the podcast, Russell Bennett, who is a lawyer at a Toronto, Ontario. So Russell, welcome to the Candid Savage. Thank you. It's uh, great to be yeah. here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I, uh, for those of you that are probably asking how I found him, the internet. That's how I found him. <laughs> <clears throat> sorry if my voice sounds a little squirrely. I got a frog in my throat today. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, so tell us a little bit about you so people can kind of get a background on you, like where you've started. I know you've already told me your background, and I think it's amazing, your transition, um, and we have a lot in common. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm born and raised in Toronto. Um, I love I love Toronto, but I also hate Toronto. It's kind of love-hate affair. Um <laughs> You know, it's on it's on the water. It's on Lake Ontario, so it's like a you know, uh, it's a beautiful beach town that probably most of the city never actually sees the beach. So I made it a point when I moved back with my wife and uh, who was pregnant at the time from Vancouver uh, that we would move to the beach. So actually, I I love Toronto because of the beach. Because um, I grew up in in North York in. Uh, suburbia and uh, don't really like suburbia but um, it's the bougie side of town yeah it is <laughs> and a lot of, what i call it it's bougie and car culture and i don't know it's uh yeah boring boring <laughs> so uh so yeah i i i didn't really want to be a lot yeah it's funny i'm a, you you know you introduced me as a cannabis lawyer i'm not i don't really identify myself as a lawyer um, but I am a lawyer. I've, I've been a lawyer for, <laughs> since 1997, so it's kind of funny to say that. But actually, I, I've gone between being a lawyer and being um, an actor and filmmaker and playwright. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I've had a mixed bag of a career. Um, yeah, so, you know, you know, as soon as I became a lawyer, I started making a documentary uh, because that's what most lawyers do, right? Uh, and it was it was a documentary about um, legalizing marijuana, oddly enough. And it's funny now we call it cannabis because, like, my whole life I've called it marijuana. And just this past year, <laughs> trying to like everything's changing. It's like I'm, I'm, it's no longer marijuana. We're calling it cannabis. We're cleaning this thing up. We're gonna. Your life has been flipped upside that's down. It. That's it. Marijuana is gone. And 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 there was that that dilemma of like. The good guys always spelled marijuana with a J, but the bad guys always spelled it with an H. And there was like this distinguish, distinguishing. But if if you were like, if you didn't know anything about marijuana, you'd use the H, or you you know wanted to control it, you use the H. And if you wanted to like be the freedom fighter, you'd, <laughs> you'd use the J. But now it's cannabis. We're all part of the same happy family. You know, we've all joined forces together. Um, so anyway, yeah, uh, I, I became a lawyer in 1997, and uh, I guess a month after I got my call to the bar, um, I uh, I visited my brother in Guelph, who took me immediately to a, a 
hemp store called Hemp Asylum. And then um, on the, the counter of this hemp store was a little pamphlet, a little flyer. It said, Hemp Boy launches constitutional challenge of Canada's marijuana law. And I was like, what is this? This sounds amazing. I mean, because I, I obviously had smoked not a ton of pot, but a considerable amount of pot through, through law school, through my undergrad, even high school. I, I, I first smoked it when I was in high school. I was uh, 15. And um, yeah, actually, can I, I'll just go back to that moment in time for a second and I'll, I'll jump forward to, to, to law school. But I, cause I have to say high school, like what a great name for a school. And it was there that I learned all about <laughs> drugs because an, a police officer came in to our English class with a three panel display case of drugs. And I was in a boys school, um, all boys school. And like, I think we were all looking at this going, this is, this could be our future. Like this, of course we were, we were meant to be scared, but it had the opposite effect. It's the cop's fault here upon him. Right? I mean, I, I just looked at this going, this is, what is this thing? I've never, I never knew about drugs. It was actually the police officer who introduced me <laughs> to marijuana. And I'm grateful. I'm so grateful. Like, his, he was like, this is really bad. You should never try this. So immediately, of course, I wanted to try it. And um, a not so friend of mine kind of bought some and, and then I bought some from him and I don't know where it came from. But uh, my friend and I, we went back to his house, and this was like 1987 or something. It's a 86 or 87, I can't really remember. But um, it was when um, I think President Reagan was was in power in the states, and he was nominating uh, Judge Ginsburg, and this judge had admitted in the late 80s that he had smoked marijuana. And this was when Nancy Reagan came out with her campaign of just say no. And then, you know, it, the, the shit hit the fan and it was all over the news. Basically, so I come with my friend into his house. His dad is, a, uh, I think, is a proctologist. And we went up to his bedroom and we're trying to figure out how to roll a joint. I have no idea how to roll a joint. We're kind of making it up as we go <laughs> along and taking the seeds out. It's all it's, it's kind of. I have no idea what we're doing, but I can know from Cheech and Chong that I can do this. And, <laughs> and so as we're rolling the joint, his dad is yelling downstairs to his grandmother, who's hard of hearing, it's marijuana, it's pot. And I'm looking at my friend going, what the fuck is happening here? And I had no idea that, <laughs> that his dad was talking about President Reagan's nomination of Judge Ginsburg and Judge Ginsburg had admitted to smoking marijuana. But that whole thing just kind of set the whole thing on fire. And I was just like, this is crazy. This, I, I've got to get, I got to get more of this stuff. This is so much fun. So uh, from there, I, you know, I wasn't really a pothead. Like I was a, I was a straight A student. Uh, you know, I, I did great in school and, uh, I, you know, I went on to a Bachelor of Science, did biology, and then a little uh, passageway into um, environment and resource studies. And then, and then law and law was kind of like the fallback was like, I didn't really want to go to law school. I got into a law school because I was weird and they like to accept weird people into this school. It was Windsor. I'll be honest with you. I love Windsor. I love university of Windsor, but they accepted people who were not, you know, the typical Osgood hall law graduate uh, type. So, um, as you can probably tell from the way I'm talking. About so anyway, um, my favorite, you're my favorite kind of Thank lawyer. You. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> uh, wow, I, I've never nobody's ever said that to me before. I'm kind of blushing over here. Um, so yeah, uh, I, 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 I went to I, I went to law school, and and it, I just I guess I I enjoyed the company of fellow pot smokers. We we would watch you know Wayne's World. And we'd eat a lot of Doritos and talk about, you know, uh, wormholes and other things. And just like, I don't know, it was, it was law school, but it was also like an education in, um, in, in pot. And so when I, when I graduated, it was like, I, you know, this is illegal. What? How is that possible? <laughs> Why? It's so much fun. I enjoy it. 
I maybe I think I had a paranoid episode once, and I was like, "What is that? What was that? You know that that was weird. Yeah. Didn't really like that, but um, it didn't stop me from from pursuing different different uh, flavors and strands and trying to you know learn about this thing. But really, what started to intrigue mm-hmm. me was the law, and this this uh, constitutional challenge going going back to Guelph Hemp Asylum that you know in 1996. I was like intrigued by the fact that we had this law and that this guy who was the same age as me at 26 years of age had this store in London, Ontario called Hemp Nation. And he was arrested and his store's inventory was confiscated. He had pipes and bongs and guides, grow guides. And he, he had been selling seeds for two years and never got caught, never was arrested. Hmm. And he, he, he displayed them in the window. So, you know, the, the police could see that he was selling seeds, but they, they left him alone because it was a good store, it was a big store, and, um, and there was no problem. But I guess one day they decided to arrest him. So he faced four life sentences. What? Yeah, what? and that was, the, that was the maximum penalty he could, he could get. It was four life sentences. So I, I, I was reading this pamphlet going, that's insane. Like, that would be me. You know, like what? I'm not a criminal. How's this guy a criminal? Like, what's going on? This guy, and his name was Chris Clay. He was the sweetest, like skinniest, fair-haired boy. He had a little ah, at the end end of everything that he said. Like, I just couldn't believe this guy was was going to get um, jail time for selling seeds. So, ah, uh, so I said, okay, I've got to make a movie about this guy. I've got to make a documentary. I, I'd taken a film class. Um, in, in university, I'm like, this guy needs a documentary. This is a test case. This is the one case. This could change the whole world mm. right here. This guy. So I had to film it. I had a little money from <coughs> uh, my bar mitzvah savings, which was like about five, 6,000 bucks. I was like, okay, I'm going to plow it in there. I'm going to find a guy who can shoot this thing. And I found, you know, in Toronto, I found this guy, uh, Jeremy Benning. He was an amazing cinematographer. He did a lot of uh, uh, music videos and commercials and and he just was all over this thing he helped me get all the equipment for everything my friend sarah jane flynn from uh from from university we we teamed up and we started making this documentary about chris clay and his constitutional challenge and the lawyer at the time who who his lead lawyer was alan young a professor at, at osgood hall law school and he was like he's so amazing he's He's, he has really led the way for le- legalizing marijuana in this country. It's amazing. That guy, he really deserves, he deserves a medal. Um, I followed him and he, he opened up the entire defense uh, team to me, all the witnesses, the expert witnesses that they flew in from all over North America to testify in this London courthouse in front of this old judge, this supernumerary judge who's 75 years old. His name is Justice McCart. This old stodgy guy, and I was McCart. McCart. Yeah, it's right? fantastic. It's like Paul Blart. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and he 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 would he actually gave me an interview. And judges usually don't or are not allowed to give interviews, but he gave me an interview. I couldn't believe it. I I also got an interview with Alan Rock, who was the Justice Minister at the time, and uh, and, and I got I got some amazing amazing footage, put it together, and tried to pitch it to the C- CBC. Got this two-minute promo video. It was on VHS, and uh, and and the the guy, oh, so, so old, old right? <laughs> this guy, the, the the CBC guy, said to me, "Listen, Russell, legal marijuana is not one of the ten topics I'm interested in putting on the CBC. It is no no interest at all. Okay, there's no interest. My re- my viewers do not care about marijuana. I'm like, you're wrong. You're totally wrong. This is I'm leading edge here. You've got to listen to me." Anyway, he rejected me, so I went to City TV. They gave me a green light, and then Ross Rebliati lost his gold medal of snowboarding. Do you remember that? I remember that. Ross Rebliati, and he's got his own brand called Ross's Gold now, but he lost his gold medal, and marijuana was in the news every day. And guess what? CBC came calling, said, Russ, we want your documentary. I was like, okay, that's good double the price. So they aired it across the country, uh, 1997. 
and, or 98, yeah, 98. And it was a hit. It was like the best documentary of the year. I was so on fire. It was like, it was, it was one of those moments in your life where you are totally on fire. Like everything, it, everything is in flow. And it was beautiful. It was a beautiful experience. And then next year it was nominated mm. for uh, Best Political Documentary at Hot Docs. It was amazing. amazing. It was amazing. So that, that kind of was my intro into learning about marijuana and all the issues because I got to interview all the experts in the world. Like I, I got to interview two Ladane commissioners. Do you know that? Have you heard of the Ladane Commission? Not a clue. Okay. Not a clue. Sounds oh, impressive, man. though. Ashley, you gotta, you're gonna love this. Okay, so 1969, almost 50 years ago, the Ladane Commission was this um, group of scholars headed by Gerald Ladane, who was the dean of Osgoode Hall Law School at the time, and he be, he, he later became a Supreme Court judge, and the whole uh, commission was tasked with it was called the commission of inquiry into the non-medical use of drugs and basically it was um examining marijuana for four years they interviewed uh 15, people including like john lennon like it was it was a massive effort they published four books i got to interview two of the commissioners marie andre bertrand and Heinz Lehmann, and um, he gave me, he gave me, I think, one of the best quotes for the, for the documentary. Is called, uh, he said, um, I said, I said, so why, the question was, why didn't the government change the law based on the Ladane Commission? Because the, the, the Ladane Commission concluded after four years of work uh, that marijuana should be decriminalized, at least. And then one mm -hmm. um, commissioner, Marie Andre, she said it should actually be legalized and should be like sold and, and you know, uh, distributed and regulated. She was way ahead of her time. This was in 1972. Wow. And, and, and the Trudeau government, it was the, the you know, um, Pierre Trudeau, he just uh, swept it under the, the rug and there was an election and it just got, it got tossed, all that work. But um, Heinz Lehman said to me, I said, so why, you know, why, why didn't it work? And, and, he, and he said, well, politics, rule everything and politics are not based on intellect a terrible mm. accent there, but there you get the idea so um so yes so that that was like just an eye-opening explosion into why marijuana was not a gateway drug why it was not criminogenic why uh you know didn't cause crime why um uh mm -hmm. marijuana you know uh, didn't kill people so it, it just kind of, it dispelled that case, Chris Clay's case, dispelled all the myths about marijuana and Judge McCart wrote about them. And he, but of course he, he found Chris guilty because he wasn't going to change the law. So they had to appeal it to the Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal said, no, you're, you're still guilty. Appeal it to the Supreme Court with two <laughs> other um, appellants. And it became this triumvirate possession case. And the, of course, the Supreme Court said, you know, no, you're guilty. But the dissenting opinion was, and it, it should be mandatory reading for everybody in law school. It was an incredible opinion uh, uh, um, um, that said we should decriminalize, that this is an insane thing, that, that Chris Clay and his mm -hmm. appellants should not be uh, uh, charged with possession for this. So that was, the, that was, that was my whole intro into, into uh, pot. Decriminalization, um, and I know that there's what you call it, ditch weed. I think we're talking ditch about like ditch weed. Yes, but yeah, like the bullshit weed, ditch weed, whatever you want to call it, organized crime. Yeah, that's a problem, especially how they're growing it and all that kind of shit. I'm not all for that, um, but I think, in my opinion, we should just decriminalize the stupid thing. But now we see that it's just being legalized. Uh, Do you know the difference, really? This, the difference between decriminalizing and legalizing? Because I, this is this is it's hazy for me. I don't know. What, what, do you know the difference? Like what the difference between decriminalizing and legalizing is? So I'm probably like you. So I yes. I Google, which I'm. I'll say I'm Google okay. certified in marijuana, um, or cannabis <laughs> now. Sorry. From what I'm reading, I'm probably maybe I'm interpreting it incorrectly. 
is that decriminalizing means obviously you're not going to be charged if it's on your person. Right. Um, but you can't have storefront, whereas legalizing is obviously controlled by government. And there's stores like LCBO in Ontario where it's still sold. Um, you have to be 19 years or older to buy it. But I think with decriminalization, I haven't really read anything about like storefront. Right. But maybe exactly. I'm just getting that it's mixed up. Who gets to sell it and buy it, basically? What? It's right. By it's con- so so it, it, it takes the. So legalizing really means that instead of the growers in the mountains of BC selling to me, now it's going to be companies that are regulated by the government selling to me, growing and selling to me, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's basically changing the hands of who's growing it and who's selling it. That's, that's legal. Yeah. I think that's legalization. And decriminalization is just not getting charged for having it. And that's what Portugal has done. I think that's what it should be. Like, I don't think personally that, you know, the 17, well, I don't think a 17 year old should be smoking high levels of THC. It'll fuck up your brain. But I don't think that a 17 year old who's going to be going to university in a year should have charges laid against them for having like five grams of fucking weed on. Right. We don't want to send kids to jail for pot. That's, I mean, that's the the basic premise of legalization. We, that's just, it's stupid. It's a waste of resources, a waste of police effort, judges, jails. It's just like such a waste of money and resources where we could be focusing on real, cli- real crime, right? So I was a volunteer auxiliary constable and a civilian with the RCMP. So when I filled the role of my volunteer duties, I worked with drugs, which my dad has, I would say, 20 years with the drug unit. One of our projects was um, outdoor grow ops. And I did them, I think it was three years in a row I did them. And honestly, from my experience going into these things, they're disgusting. Like, you go into these things, one of them had like 15,000 plants. It was outdoors in a huge swamp. And the amount of like pesticides and the shit that was around these, like they're not cared right. for properly. Um, for me, that was like, holy fuck, you're giving, like who knows who this marijuana is going to. So if it's like that 17 year old kid or 16 year old kid is buying it off of a little shit rat down the street and they're smoking it, not knowing that there's a fuckload of mold in it, the pesticides are all right. over it and now they're smoking it. For me, that's, I no. I don't like of course. That. Who does? Who does? You have to have quality control. Absolutely. But are, did you, in your experience, yeah. did you have any experience with grow ops that were good, that were well maintained? That, that none, zero in three years. None. No, no. I, we focused up. My role was focusing on the outdoor. Now, my dad, he might have different stories about indoor grow ops, and I know in Ottawa, like. Mm-hmm. they're probably everywhere but um i've only done the outdoor and was this I've all over ontario it. or other places as well uh ontario and quebec mm-hmm. yeah so like that stuff I'm not a big fan of and back then yeah. too so i left like six and a half years ago so i also was a kid who was an athlete played college level soccer and was always you know anyone could walk in and right. piss test the entire soccer team so like I was always against marijuana, especially a father that was a Mountie. I never wanted to do it. And then going in the RCMP as a civvy and as a special, there's just a lot of, you're around all the same kind of mentality. So day after day after day, you're told and shown that this is bad, bad, bad. You're never shown the good stuff. Like I was, I had no idea that you could use marijuana to help with like parkinson's or something or cancer or irritable bowel syndrome or crohn's like they don't tell you any of this it's just here's a plant this is a bad plant we can't have this and then it wasn't until about two and a half years ago two years ago when that's a lie 
four years ago, one of my friends was like, remember that time that we told you when you eventually when you quit the RCMP, we'd make you smoke a joint. Yeah. And I was like, yes. And so right. he passes me a vape. I'm like, you fucking kidding me right now? He's <laughs> like, do it. So there's like five of my friends in this living room. I'm like, fuck. So I do it. And man, like I, my back was really sore that day. And let me tell you, mm. I felt like a million bucks. And I was like, yeah. what the fuck? And right. do I smoke it all the time? No. But um, then that got me. I was like, okay, it's not that bad, whatever. But I don't, I don't buy it. And then two years ago, my sister got diagnosed with Crohn's disease after years of not knowing what the fuck was wrong. And what helps her, and she's not on any pharmaceutical drugs. She goes through, she went through a doctor. She gets her stuff mailed to her when she needs it through an LP, which for those of you that don't know what an LP is, it's a licensed producer. And she gets what she needs. So if she does get a flare up, she can take whatever that she needs and she's fine. And after seeing my sister go through that and seeing how much cannabis helps her, I was like, holy fuck. So then I started digging into it and digging into it. And I myself, I'm very open. Mm -hmm. I use CBDs, cannabidiol, to help with anxiety and also my training because my, my hip is super fucked from sports. So I take CBD to help lower the inflammation and take the pain away. And had you told me CBD maybe like nine years ago, I'd be like, no, it's mm -hmm. for marijuana. That's bad. Whereas now I'm like, give me all <laughs> right. of the CBD. <laughs> so, and that's another thing, question that I'm still trying to find out is how they're going to loop in cannabidiol, which is shown to help so many things because it's not psychoactive, is how, you know, how is the government going to end up are they going to try and seize the CBD and try and make money off it? Because CBD, in my opinion, is so different from obviously THC, which is psychoactive and can affect mm -hmm. a youth's brain growing up. But there's nothing like everything I'm reading. It's all about THC, 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 but they're not talking about any other of the right. constituents within marijuana. And so my my fear is they're going to try and fucking block that off from people getting mm. cannabidiol well the the way i understand the the way the, the big picture of it is that there's two systems now in canada there's the medical system and the recreational system mm. and the medical system has been in place yeah. since 2001 uh because of uh terry parker the man who suffered from epilepsy grew his own plants was arrested and eventually won the right to have his own plants, to have his own medicine because it prevented his seizures and, and he couldn't get a reliable source. Mm. So then, then, then they tasked the, um, the government, the, the, uh, the court said, well, okay, government, now you've got to set up a regulation, set up a regime to make medical marijuana available to people. And, and that, and that's the CBD that you're talking about. Mostly, I mean, THC definitely has therapeutic effects. And, and so does CBD. And those are two of many, many compounds um, because there's CBDA, there's THCA, yeah. TH, you know, there's, there's so many different ones. Shitload. But, you know, most people are just focusing on THC or, or CBD. And when you go to the, the, the websites of these licensed producers, the Health Canada has, um, has licensed to grow it. Uh, the licensed producers put the content, the percentage content on the sites for each strain. So, you know, you white widow, mm -hmm. you have THC is uh, this strain has like 20% you know, THC, but it also has like 5% CBD. And then you can have all different kinds of mixes and strains um, to, to get the effect that you need, whether it's pain relief or anxiety relief or, 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 or something more serious like seizures. And, and, uh, and so the medical system is, is how, we came to uh, to the legalization question. I think it's after you know fourteen, fifteen years of this medical uh, industry growing, and then uh, company big companies starting to take it over, and uh, 
the quality starting to get better and the distribution starting to get a little better and uh, problems starting to get ironed out. It, but Health Canada really dragging its feet, to be fair, and having to be forced by people yeah. going to court, paying lots of money to lawyers to fight for their right to either grow or have somebody else grow or, you know, access it um, in, in different ways and forms, whether it's dried herb or oil. I mean, most people who need it for medicine, they don't want to smoke the flower. They don't want to, they don't want to roll a joint and smoke it. That's not the thing. They want to get a, 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 a capsule, you know, and, um, Interesting. Capsule oil. Topical. Cool. Some, you know, something to just like, like a pill, you know, take a, an aspirin. You want to take your CBD. And, and why not? We have the technology. It's working. Let's make it work. And so, you know, I don't think that CBD is going to go away. I don't think it's going to be controlled uh, where people won't be able to get it. But I think it's, it's got to be made more widely available and more easily obtainable. Because right now, in order to get it, you got to get it to go online. You got to call got to get a mail order it's got to be delivered to you that's the system we have delivery and that's not effective and the other thing the other thing i wonder that if the government which i don't think they know what the fuck they're doing anyway but is hemp versus marijuana so like hemp doesn't produce thc and that's where you get a lot of the cbd out of exactly and the hemp industry is now licking their lips and rubbing their hands together going okay Let's go. Let's let's grow, folks, because they're so excited now that finally they're going to be a serious industry because they've been handicapped since 98 under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, like being treated like it's like it's marijuana, but it's actually hemp yeah. it has no psychoactive component to it. It's a really tall plant. I love hemp. I'm going to actually I'm going to be a hemp farmer in my 50s for sure. And. Because I want to, I want to grow hemp. Pa- I want to make hemp paper, and specifically, okay. I want to make hemp toilet paper. Because everybody needs toilet paper. Interesting. And why should we cut down trees when we can wipe our butts with a flower? So, <laughs> <laughs> that's this is my idea anyway. I'm, but seriously, <laughs> hemp is uh, is is a major source of CBD, and so all these hemp farmers are going to go. Yes, now not only are we growing hemp for the hemp seeds and your protein shakes, but we're also going to grow it for the CBD oil and the medical. So my question would that be, is the government going to tell these hemp farmers that they now have to be licensed producers? Mm, there'll be a separate license for them, I'm sure. But the, what, what they'll experience will be less red tape, I'm hoping. Because right now, to be a hemp farmer, mm. you, have to, you have to do a lot, of, a lot of paperwork, which has been the barrier to entry. And you have to suffer inspections yeah. because they're worried. You're also going to grow marijuana. So they want to make sure you're not growing marijuana at the same time you're growing hemp. So, you know, it's, there, there has to be some uh, controls. But I think that hemp farmers will now experience a boost in their industry because of this Cannabis Act. And it'll be taken, mm-hmm. hopefully, hemp will be taken out of the Controlled Drug and Substances Act. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't even know why it's there to be. Well, they're probably just yeah. not educated, and they're like, "Oh, it looks yeah. the same as marijuana. Let's put it in the same." Well, exactly, it's the act. same Latin cannabis name. Like, it's, it's, it comes from the Cannabinaceae family, you know. So that's that's why they. Oh, it's it's got to be the same thing. Yeah, yeah, um, and plastic. That's exciting so, to me too. Oh my gosh, you can plastic? make plastic out of hemp. This is really. Lego. You're gonna be a. You're gonna be your own little Dude, corner store. It is soon. going to be. <laughs> as I'm building a empire. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> yes. So what are the what are some of the challenges you you see coming or might be an issue with the legalization coming up in uh, October? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Cannabis Act is an interesting beast. Have you looked at it? Bill C forty five Royal Assent. June 21st, first day of summer. I love that it got Royal Assent on the first day of summer. That's really cool. I have the Ontario okay. one up. So that's, it was kind of giving you like what the hell's yes, coming that's for Ontario. Different. That's provincial. So let's go to federal. Like, see, this is the thing. There's federal act, which is called the Cannabis Act. And then there's the uh, Ontario Act, which is also called the Cannabis Act, just to confuse everybody. How many Cannabis Acts can we have in Canada? <laughs> like 15 different Cannabis Acts. So yes, the, you'll find... 
PillC45 at a website called www.parl, P-A-R-L dot C-A. Go. Go in there, people. Let's Go in there. This is so exciting. Boom. Right. What do you find out? There's so many. I think this is why it's also yes. super confusing for people because there's so many right. fucking things on all over the internet. And again, like you said, provincial versus federal. And then you have, you know, like Manitoba, Quebec, Nunavut saying we don't even want home grow. And all these this provinces the are kind of just you know, like doing really their own is. thing. There, there's so much information out there and it's all like all over the place. And not, So yeah, you've got the federal act, you've got the provincial act, and then you're going to have municipal bylaws that govern all kinds of things that the provinces don't want to touch you know so you can have three different levels of government governing mm-hmm. the same flower it's funny to me it's everybody wants a piece everybody stupid. wants their, their 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 little piece and there you go boom royal assent why do we have queen elizabeth on our legislation still people why i don't understand oh my god we are not in the monarchy anymore. Anyway, whatever. <sighs> Statutes of Canada, 2018, Chapter 16, an act respecting cannabis and to amend the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Criminal Code, and other acts. Assented to June 21st, first day of summer, 2018, Bill C-45. So there you go. There it is. This is, this is the new law. This, is a, this has been uh, anointed. It's been assented to. It's been spit on. We all love this law now. It's been knighted. Knighted, we are we are fully in for it. We're almost gonna be fully in force until you know October seventeen. But th- this is the basic stuff here, and and then you'll see what go with the summary, and you'll see this enactment enacts the Cannabis Act to provide legal access to cannabis, woohoo, and to control and regulate its production, distribution, and sale. Good. This is legalization. That's what legalization means right there. But what are the objectives of the act? Well, we don't want young persons accessing cannabis, right? That's not cool. Mm-hmm. Young persons are defined below in the uh, definition section. So on the right side, you'll see interpretation, short title, interpretation, application. So those are quick links to the, uh, the act. There's like over 200 sections. It's ridiculous. And for those of you wondering about this that actually wants to read it or even Cole's note it, I'll put the link at the bottom of the, um, on the podcast. You just click it and go, Right to what we're looking at yeah. so you can get yourself educated. Yeah, yeah. This is really good reading. It's, uh, it's very confusing. And um, it, it, it gets into the minds of the people that run the country. Right? This is where they're thinking. Okay? So here, the objectives of the act are to prevent young persons from accessing cannabis, to protect public health and public safety by establishing strict product safety and product quality requirements, and to deter criminal activity by imposing serious criminal penalties for those operating outside the legal framework. They're and still going to do it. Of course. <laughs> of course they're going to do strict, it. Strict legal whatever. They're still, they've been doing it for years. They're going to continue doing it for years. Yes. It's not going to deter them from doing shit. But the penalties can be and are more severe in this act than they are in the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. So... Um, but it, I like the, the last sentence of the summary here because it says the act is also intended to reduce the burden on the criminal justice system. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Because <laughs> there's still going to be people who want to, who love to grow cannabis and do not want to be regulated by the government. Right? Yeah. So th- that's that's what we're, we're going to be facing. I, I just want to jump down to section 200. So now if you if you open up in another window the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, what you will find is uh, the current law, which is going to be in force until October 17. This is where, you know, we, where we are right now, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And there's a general um, a, a pr- provision, just like this in, in, in paragraph 200, because it says paragraphs 46A and B of the Act are replaced by the following. And that means f- uh, sections 46 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act are replaced by the following. Now, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, section 46, says for general 
non-specified offenses. If a judge is looking at somebody and goes, you know what, I don't, I'm not sure, what, what should I be doing with this person? They have this fallback section in the, in the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which says, for an indictable offense, which means indictable, so it, offenses are, are categorized in two ways. One is indictable offense, or one is an offense by summary conviction. Those are two, two ways. One is basically with a jury, and one's without. One's more serious, indictable offense. One's not so serious, summary conviction, no jury. Okay? So for indictable offenses, serious, the maximum fine a judge can give someone is $5,000 and or three years maximum in prison. Combination of the, one or two, a combination of those things. Five grand, three years. For summary convictions, you get a $1,000 fine max or six months of prison and or six months of prison. So you get both or whatever, whatever the judge wants. So those are the kind of the two categories, five grand in three years or one grand in six months. And now when you look at this paragraph, section 200, the same kind of fallback it's ridiculous. is not five grand for an indictable offense. It's five million. It's ridiculous. Like, how did they even come up with this number? $5 million. I looked at it. I was like, how do you go from 5000 to $5 million? Is that a typo? Right. Like, I don't did, understand. Did, exactly. Did somebody just lean on their zero key for a little too long? <laughs> like, oh, sorry. Oh, that's law. Sorry. I, you're kind of slow. I fell asleep. My bad. <laughs> too much CBD in my coffee. So <laughs> that's, that's one kind of like eye-opening, what? This is legalized? Are you sure? And then for a summary conviction... In subparagraph B of section 200, $250,000 for a first offense. That's ridiculous. Right? Same jail time. You either get three years for an indictable or six months for a first offense or uh, 18 months for a subsequent offense. But, whoa, 500000 for a subsequent offense on a summary conviction. Now, the, the, again, these are intended to be kind of fallback things for a judge to rely on if... You know, they're not sure what to do above. And, mm. and, and the, main, the main offenses are in sections uh, 9 um, through 12 of the Cannabis Act. So you've got your, your basic penalties are possession, uh, distribution, selling, and production. Those are the basic penalties. So you can't, for example, you can't possess anything, as everybody knows now, over any, if you're an adult, you can't possess anything more than 30 grams. So you're walking around the street in your backpack. You can't have any more than 30 grams. That's a lot of pot for one person. I was going to say, I'm like, that's, a, that's a lot of weed. I, you know, I buy five grams. That lasts me a long time. Me and my wife, we're mm -hmm. smoking five grams. It's going to take us like a month. Maybe not. It depends how bad the kids are on a given day. But, you know, joking. The, the, uh, <laughs> I've got a six-year-old and a two-year-old, so we're busy. But the uh, for 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 kids, you can't carry around in your backpack more than five grams, and that's for that's for kids aged twelve to eighteen. And and that's not because we want kids twelve to aged eighteen to carry around five grams or less of marijuana in their backpacks. No, and so that if they're caught with that, that they're not going to get a criminal record. They're not going to go through the justice. Mm -hmm system they're not they're only going to get a ticket right so you get a ticket i don't i don't know how how they can come up with a number of 30 grams because i mean if you're carrying around 30 grams of marijuana to me that's kind of saying you're gonna sell yeah maybe like Less. why does one person need 30 grams of marijuana well but think about it in terms of oil if you're using it for your epilepsy seizures think about it kind True. of think about it like more. medical terms more i think that that's kind of a a transfer from the medical system um and it's kind of the minimum amount for basic medical issues you know because like my sister she has it but she ain't walking around with 30 grams of decarb no, no. <laughs> like that's so i'm like mm. yeah but i get it like my sister when she has a huge flare-up she's using a considerable amount of medical marijuana but i mean i don't know i think 30 grams still though yeah and if you're, if you're talking to the money really... too it's like it's 300 dollars worth of stuff right at 10 grams 10 dollars a gram so mm. 
it's not a lot of money worth of you know pot it's like true it's pretty pretty basic like you're not going to make a lot of money off of selling three hundred dollars worth of marijuana no and i guess that's the other question a lot of people have is you know like what is the the going rate for a typical gram of weed going to be now that it's is legalized is it going to be more expensive is like the LCBO going to jack the prices versus the street stuff? Well, see, the, if the goal is to reduce organized crime, if the goal is to outgrow them, outsell them, outcompete them, then you want to price it accordingly. Like if, if the so-called black market is going to be selling for se- the average price is six to seven bucks, They've already said, oh, it's going to be $10. I'm thinking like, well, aren't you, that's, no, 10? <laughs> Come on, think about it. This basic economics. I could buy it for six or I could buy it for 10. Uh, I'm going to buy it for yeah. six. Hello. You got to price it at four, dude. You got to price it at two. You got to price it at 250. Low, low price. You got to, you got to edge them out, right? But I don't know. The government's mm-hmm. like, coming out with all, all this $10 gram stuff. It doesn't make well, any sense. They want to make money. Of course, but they, they can make money. They can make money. It only costs them a dollar to make it. Mm-hmm. A dollar. Even it's less. Government. It's the government. Even less. Look, you, you've, got, you've got these massive, massive warehouses producing massive amounts of sea of green bud that's just kind of uh, like Walmart. No offense to Walmart, but Walmart bud. It's like Bud Light Bud. And no offense to Bud Light drinkers. Seriously. I just don't like Bud Light. If I'm going to drink beer, I'm going to drink like Bose beer cuz Bose has they love their beer. They they're a family-run company, you know. They I don't know. I just like I I like Bose. It's a good flavor. The Skoka beer, you know? Um I'm not I'm not partial to Molson's X, but of course somebody will be. So they're going to buy it. Mm-hmm. But to price it right is going to eliminate the, the black market because the black market's going to be like, well, geez, the government's selling it for $4 a gram. I'm going to make money. You know, mm-hmm. they, they won't be able to. So that's my little free advice to the government. Gigantic money pit. Yeah. It's just like pharma. Like you look at some of these pharmaceutical companies charging like $1,000 a pill. Uh, I know. Like, fuck Seriously? off. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I know you've poured your years of development research into the pill, but someone's life, like thousand dollars a pill, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I hate that. Like my aunt, she's going through cancer, and the doctor was like, "Well, um, we can give you this pill that can stop your cancer growth, but um, it's a thousand dollars a pill." Uh, so, and my aunt's like, uh, "How many am I going to have to take? Number yes. one, and number two, like, is it covered?" And, no, it's not covered. It's like, so you want me to pay thousands of dollars a month for a pill that won't cure my cancer, but it'll stop it. Okay, thanks. <sighs> like, it's fucking stupid. Anyway, she's doing medical marijuana now, and she went from a couple weeks to she's back home, not in the Briere, oh, and uh, fantastic. bought some more, yeah, has, has some more time. That's beautiful. So, and maybe it's just like coincidence. Who knows? But either way, she's doing a little bit better. I'm glad to hear it. And and yeah. and that's a, an amazing story of why we need more research in this industry. Why we need more medical research. Why doctors are are not more in tune with what's going on with with marijuana's efficacy as a as mm-hmm. a as a, a, a healer. You know, it's it's a uh, it's been illegal for 95 years, you know? Like, think about it. Like, the mentality towards this flower has been, as you said, evil. You were, ta- mm-hmm. you were surrounded, you were taught that this flower is evil. It's, it's you know, uh, what was that? Reefer madness? Yeah, that's what it is. It's been reefer madness. For so long. And then, yet doctors can prescribe pills for anti-anxiety or depression that just make you even more of a fishbowl 
and that's okay. And then it ends up being being addictive, like fucking people on Percocets for pain. Right. Opioids. End up being addicted. Opioids. Yeah. Opioids. I could talk for hours about this shit. Ugh. It makes me so angry. <laughs> it's like this person is now hooked That's right. to a pill because of they broke their ankle and now they have a fucking addiction. It's kind of, it, it's also depends on your own biological makeup. Like, are you an addictive personality? Like, would, do you get yeah. addicted to alcohol? Do you get addicted to other things like cigarettes or? Um, yeah, genetic makeup. Yeah. yeah, that's a thing. It's another thing I've learned about actually this year too is your, your DNA and how it plays a role with whether it's your personality or how you absorb things or so on and so forth. Yes. Let me take you back to the Cannabis Act because I'm, I am intrigued by this piece of legislation that uh, I'm going to be all over with my law practice. And, and, that, and that is it, how different it is from the current law, you know? Like I think that, I think that the, the, the former um, charges of trafficking or possession of, for the purposes of trafficking They've, they've reworded it into two different offenses, uh, distribution mm -hmm. and selling. And so they've taken trafficking as this, this thing of like, what is trafficking? To, to really define it down and really get it more specific. And the Cannabis Act makes these offenses of distribution and selling. And distribution, they, they define it as, I love, I love these words. So distribution is not selling. A distribution is giving, transporting, transferring, sending, delivering, providing, administering, or making available. So if you if you do one of those things, if you're like sending something through the mail, or if you're giving, if I give you a 31 grams, then I'm distributing under the act. I'm distributing under the act. And if I'm an adult, yeah. then I could face 14 years of of prison for that for 31 grams giving it giving it to somebody so that's that's a really interesting thing to me that's if you're a young person which is uh, any anybody younger than 18 then you know you, you're going to be sentenced according to the um, youth criminal justice act they don't they don't put the penalties in, in the cannabis act for for young people so what about people that are wanting are licking their chops right now because they're like, oh, it's becoming legalized. I'm going to open a dispensary. Uh, uh, <laughs> ditch weed. Well, okay. <laughs> let, let, let me clear up this ditch weed thing because I know you come from the world of um, grow ups are bad. And I, and I get that. But there's also, um, from my experience, a different side to the black market, which I don't think is so black. I think it's actually quite green. Mm. And so this different side, um, I think. For example, the, the quality, if we're talking about pure quality and quality in, is, is, is uh, measurable by so many different factors, because, you know, the, the, the difference in quality between um, a really great Merlot and a really like crappy Merlot, you know, a really beautiful mm. um, uh, wine and, and a, or a really beautiful scotch and a really cheap scotch, right? So that we know the difference in, in booze, what's quality? How do we know the difference in cannabis, what's quality and what's not? What's ditch weed and what's good weed? How, how are you going to know that, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, if you're coming into this new, you have no idea. Uh, how are you supposed to know? Well, this guy produced mm -hmm. this. He's, he's created this thing called, uh, his company is called High North Labs. And I talked to him a couple weeks ago about this very issue for a court case that I've got going. Um, and uh, I don't think he'll be my expert witness because of a conflict, but he got into such detail about how you determine quality. And he really focused mm. on these things called terpenes. And I think that this word terpene, yep. before like a couple of years ago, I've never heard of terpene before. This is all new language coming out. This word terpene is is going to revolutionize this industry because you're not assessing quality based on <clears throat> just THC or CBD, but you're going to, you're going to want to smell it and touch it and feel it. And you're going to want to take that bud and really understand from a visceral sense before you even smoke it or vape it or whatever you do with it. You want to know what the quality is. Terpenes are going to tell you, is it, does it have lemony? Yeah. 
citrusy tone? Does it have more of a skunky undertone? You know, like it's a real, it's a real art form. And this is all measure, measurable. This is all, you can analyze this with, uh, with chemistry. So what this guy told me at Heinrich Labs is that most of the cannabis that is grown by the licensed producers, and there are now 111, as of today, 111 licensed producers in Canada. Most of the, of the cannabis that they're growing he, he, he would say like 90 to 95% of it is like a C to C plus on a scale. It's like average kind of ordinary bud. Hmm. What he's found is that a lot of the dispensaries actually test for higher quality. A lot, most dispensaries. So I've got a client who's a dispensary. He's a dispensary chain from Vancouver and they're in Toronto. They were in Toronto. They're fighting the city. It's a bylaw charge. A very, very exciting case, and it's going to be a constitutional challenge. And, and so, mm-hmm. uh, part of it it is based on like these. The, this dispenser was growing for medicinal purposes. Uh, grow, sorry, they were buying from growers for medicinal purposes and selling to customers in a storefront, and for medicinal purposes mm-hmm. specifically. And they're really catering to that market, and. They, they test their bud before they sell it, and they will not sell ditch weed. They, are, they have a high self-standard of quality. And they uh, have a higher quality of bud than most of the licensed producers. So, so then it gets me thinking, like, so, okay, how are we going to get really high-quality bud? How do we get it from the licensed producers? Can you get it from licensed producers? Well, this is where the government... Yeah thinking is, oh, craft cannabis. And this is a whole new world that has yet to be explored, yet to be regulated. The world of craft cannabis is like craft beer. It's like the Bose beer that I like. I, I, I am excited about craft cannabis because I consider myself to be a cannabis connoisseur. I want good cannabis. I, I, I think there's nothing better than having the ability to smoke or vape really high quality cannabis and in doses that that achieve the effect that you want for me i i'm excited by sativas and the uplifting effect that sativas have on your brain because i'm a, i'm a writer as well so i i love to write and i get really in, uh, in uh, big inspiration and and a lot of creative focus from just a little bit of sativa and I've perfected the dose. I don't need a lot, just a tiny bit, but I, I have my strains that I like, you know? And so that's, I don't know that I'm going to be able to get that from the Ontario Cannabis Store. So yeah, I think that that is a whole new world that is, uh, is waiting for us, is this, this idea of quality and what is quality and how much are you willing to pay for it? Who's going to grow it? How can we license them? Can we bring people like my client, who's a dispensary, into the green market into the the system Mm, i don't know you know they've been on the fringes for so long maybe maybe some of them have criminal records will they be expunged with the new law you know are they going to be able to be accepted by this new legislation you know are they going to be vilified again you know like yeah it's very interesting i'm sorry i'm just i'm monologuing you and no but like i'm sitting here nodding my head, which no one can see because you, you legitimately brought up some very good points that to be honest, I wasn't thinking that same path as you. Like I know like people that are growing their weed are very specific and caring about their plants, but the way you worded it and put it together, I'm kind of like, that's a, it's a good, it's a good point because I look at dispensaries and I'm like, what the fuck are you yes. growing? Who are you getting it from? Is it black market shit? You're selling at your, at your yes. selling at your counter, but not realizing, like you just said, there are people that have better stuff than our LPs, which are pumping yes, it out. And and they're the LPs are designed to mass produce. That's what the sea of green means. The sea of green is a, mm-hmm. is a method of growing where you grow, uh, you 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 flower the flower flower faster. So typically. A plant uh, will will flower in like seven to nine weeks. Sea of green flowers in two. Mm. 
two weeks, boom. And, and it creates this, in, a, in an indoor grow, this canopy effect of all these buds in this sea of green. That's why, that's where the name canopy growth comes from, by the way, is this canopy of bud. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's a fast method of growing a lot of plants and a high turnover rate, but the quality is low. Quality is not, it's not exciting to me. It's, you, and, and I've got four different companies' buds uh, to sample. And there's another problem, Ashley, and that is when you get the bud from these companies, they have to, according to Health Canada, they must irradiate it. It's like they microwave it and dry it. So when you get it, hmm. it's this dried product. It's kind of like crumbly and toasty. And it's, it's, um, it doesn't have life to it. It's not, because the kind of bud that, that you roll, you put into a joint has, has moisture. It has sponginess. It has life. It has a really good scent. And, and that kind of bud you mm -hmm. can't get from the LPs. And, and the LP is the only source of bud in the system that's legitimate. So it's kind of like hmm. uh, we're only going to be able to have Labatt and Molson bud, which is sad to me. Hmm. And I'm really hoping that over the course of the next year and the year after that, that this will open up and people, consumers will drive the market going, you know, this bud is not really what I want to have. I don't really, you know, can, we have, can we have some better bud, please? <laughs> It's, could somebody do something about this? So I'm, that's what I'm hoping is that with, um, for example, in Ontario with the new Ford government uh, coming into into play, I, I'm really hoping that the free market in Ontario will will exist. That will have this this amazing opportunity for Ontario to be a leader mm -hmm. of amazing bud on the planet, you know, and to show the rest of the world what we can do. BC is kind of been the the capital of bud because um you know their the law enforcement is just not as aggressive out there that vancouver's been way ahead of toronto in terms of regulating dispensaries and um and and just the the number of growers in bc you know it just it's it's more of mm -hmm. a, a connoisseur culture with the cannabis cups and and this will all start to develop as we go down the road and of course the legislation well people are going to People are going to go to jail. People are going to have to hire lawyers. People are going to have to fight it, you know. And that's uh, that's a sad reality of this new kind of legalization uh, situation we have. Um, but uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, my my idea of of legalization is that it's regulated, so we don't get that terrible swamp ditch weed grower that you encountered for three years in your life. But we get. We get the real quality, mm -hmm. like vineyard, pride, growing region of, of, of our, our grapes are now internationally known. Our, our, our you know, Pelee Island and, and our uh, Niagara Peninsula, we have award-winning uh, wine because we're investing in the quality of that. I think that's where we need to go with cannabis as well. With And with Doug Ford coming in, I know... You know, some people are for him, some aren't. What do you think, like, especially with the city of Toronto, with Ford being here, do you think Ford will allow the dispensaries and be like, you know what, people in Ontario, if they want to go get their weeds, especially in Toronto, that he's going to hammer down on dispensaries or is he still going to keep um, the door shut? I think initially, well, it's a city thing, first of all. So the, the city of Toronto has the... Um, MLS, you know, the, the, the municipal licensing and standard division, they're, they're going to come after the, probably the landlords first and, and also the tenants, the, the dispensaries to, uh, to crack down on the bylaw. But, um, but mm. I, I think because it's going to be a federal offense, it's, is it up to the police to give them the Cannabis Act uh, offenses? Or is it going to be uh, the OPP? Like, what, I guess who has jurisdiction here over the dispensaries? We've got three levels of government, right? Yeah. We don't, we don't know who's knows. going to bust them. Is it going to be the bylaw for enforcement? Is it going to be the city of Toronto police, OPP, RCMP? I mean, imagine they're all coming down on this, this store at the same time, you know? It's, they're going to send exactly, one from right? each. And I, I love how they say, 
in the Cannabis Act that we're trying to reduce law enforcement with this act. It's funny to me. But anyway, the, yes, I think that the dispensaries are going to survive because they have always survived. First of all, you've got different kinds of dispensaries. You've got the long-standing medicinal dispensaries, the, um, the, the, the ones that have been around for decades serving their medical users. Uh, because there's that whole medical side mm. of things that really, I think storefronts are so important for the medicinal side. You have to be able to, if you're a diabetic, you don't want to wait in the mail for your insulin. God, no, you can't wait for insulin to come in the mail. You've got to go get it at shoppers. Yeah. You've got to go get it at, phar- at pharma, whatever. You, you've got to just go to a store. So in the same way, you know, an epileptic is going to want to buy their medicine from a store. You've got to allow storefronts for at least medicinal purposes, right? That's so important mm-hmm. um, for the health and safety of our, our, our people that, that need it for their ailments. Um, on top of that, you know, uh, as far as the con- cannabis con- connoisseur comes into play, will the Ontario Cannabis Store cater to everybody? No, they won't. I'm going to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy some mm-hmm. weed from the cannabis store. I want to check it out. I'm going to try some. Why not? I mean, it's freedom, bud. Let's, let's, uh, let's check it out. But, uh, but is it going to ultimately be kind of that dry, you know, irradiated stuff? And am I going to enjoy it? I'm going to get a headache from it. I don't know. If that's the case, yeah. then the consumers will start to complain. And then the consumers will drive Mr. Ford's government to saying, hey, you know what? Let's do something about this. We're a civilized society. We made it this far. Let's just take the goalpost, just put it a little further. Let's get some storefronts in here that are run by, like like they're doing in Alberta, like they're doing maybe even BC. You got both. Why not have both? Everybody can survive. Let the market mm. decide. You know, we we can regulate it. Make sure these storefronts yeah. are regulated for health and safety. They get all their licenses. You know, we don't want restaurants. Uh, the, the the city has this great thing for restaurants. They've got this, um, you know, the 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 green, yellow, and red sign in the window. You go to the restaurants, right? They can have that for dispensaries yep. too. This one is a terrible dispensary. Do not go here. Okay, I'm not going to buy my pot tonight. <laughs> this one has a green sign. Okay, I'm going. You know, show them what you got. Yeah. Because are they going to sell organic weed at the Ontario Cannabis Store? I want organic. Fair. So many unknowns. There's we so didn't many get unknowns. to driving. We didn't get to so like all the different distillates. I mean, there's so much to cover. Um, I'm getting a feeling we should wrap. Are we wrapping yeah. up? I, I don't know. I'm getting. I thought so. We are wrapping up. Like this could be like a five hour <laughs> podcast. <laughs> we continue. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, I think we will do a part two because I mean, it's not coming into True. effect till the 17th of October. And True. we know it's going to be a shit show. So I'll probably end up doing a part two after a few months of it being legalized to see what kind of bullshit. Let's enjoy the summer. Let's smoke them while we got them. (laughs) 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 Revisit it in the fall once the the cold. Yeah, we'll see see what happens. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. I enjoy how you're you're a lawyer, but you don't like calling yourself a lawyer. That's thank you. It's kind of fun. Such Um, a pleasure. Yeah. I mean, if you can send us a link too about the documentary and stuff. Oh yeah, I think that'd be fantastic, especially for people sure. to see what you've done. Because I know a lot of people listening probably have no idea, and and I didn't when I reached out to you. I was like, what? <laughs> so we'll put up a link. Put up a link for that. Put sure. Put sure. your info. The documentary is called Stoned, by the way. Stoned, and then the subtitle is Hemp Nation on Fitting. Trial. Fitting. Because the there we go. The so I'll put all that stuff up for people. They can search for it on the internet. It's on YouTube. I put it up there. It's on YouTube, yes. Oh, fantastic. Remember, it, so it I was in the 90s. I shot it and that was my first film in the 90s. So you have to be kind. But we'll put a, I'll put a link up there so people can, can watch. And Thank you. Yeah, we'll put all your info up. And thanks for coming on and discussing the new legalization. It's definitely going to be an interesting ride the next six months. And it's, Yes, interesting and fun. I think it's going to be fun. I, I'm really looking forward to it. There's a lot of a lot of issues to uh, to tackle. Well, folks, thank you for listening to another episode on the Candid Savage. 
If you guys have questions, feel free to write in. If you guys want me to cover a topic that I haven't covered yet, feel free to write in. Always looking for new faces to bring on here, or I should say voices, because it is a podcast. So if you guys have anyone you want me to bring on or topics, let me know, and I will make shit happen. On that note, we're going to close up this episode, so I want to thank Russell for coming on. Thanks, Sam. And thank you guys for listening. Till another episode. We will see you guys later.